I know, there's already a ton of videos out there about language and the brain. You've already heard the story. Your brain has two structures highly involved in language. This frontal region, called Broca's area, is responsible for language production. It's what enables us to speak. This region back here is called Wernicke's area. It's responsible for language comprehension. It's what allows us to understand what we're hearing. And there's a pathway between these two regions called the arcuate fasciculus that transmits information from one area to the other. This creates a full circuit that allows us to hear a sentence, understand it, and then articulate a response. It's a nice story. The only problem is, it's not true. The real story of what's happening in our brains when we speak, listen, and read is so much more intriguing, so much more dynamic, and more complex than you've been led to believe. You want the real story? Here we go. I'm Ryan. And this is Language of Mind. Pierre Paul Broca was a French surgeon and a founder and secretary of the first anthropological society in 1859. Here, Broca and his colleagues were engaged in a long debate about the origin of language and the development of the brain. In 1861, Broca presented to the society the brain of a 51-year-old man named Le Bourne who had died in his hospital. For 21 years, this man had been completely unable to speak except for a single syllable. Anytime he opened his mouth, all that came out was Tom. What intrigued Broca and the members of the Anthropological Society was what they found when they performed the autopsy. LeBorn's brain had been damaged in a frontal region of the left hemisphere. Because LeBorn had had so much difficulty speaking while he was alive, Paul Broca theorized that this part of the brain must play an important role in the production of speech. He had discovered the first anatomical brain region dedicated to language. Broca called this disorder, the inability to speak caused by damage to the brain, aphasia. We can recognize Broca's aphasia by slow, laborious, non-fluent speech. Utterances are short, usually less than four words, and the ability to write is often highly impaired too. Despite all this, comprehension is usually intact. People with Broca's aphasia have a lot of trouble producing speech, but they don't seem to have much trouble comprehending it. Can you tell me, um, what does it feel like to have aphasia? Um, it's it's hard. It's um, well, it's speech. It's like um, words that don't understand. Brain is good, you know, um, but it's um, speech. Like um, I don't know. It's like. Um, Words, yuck. <laughs> 13 years after Broca's discovery, a young German physician named Karl Wernicke published what would become one of the most influential works on aphasia ever. He was only 26 years old, but what he described was a very different kind of aphasia. Broca's patients could comprehend, but couldn't speak. Wernicke described patients who could speak, but they didn't seem to understand anything. They didn't understand much of what was said to them, and even though they produced a steady stream of speech, it was mostly nonsensical. And what were we just doing with the iPad? Uh, right at the moment, they don't show a darn thing. <laughs> <laughs> the iPad that we were doing. We, me. Like, here? I'd like my change for me and change hands for me. It would happen. I would talk with Donna sometimes. We're out with them. Other people are working with them with them. I'm very happy with them. It turned out to be a very different part of the brain that was responsible for this. It was this region, at the junction of the temporal and parietal lobes. Based on this, Wernicke created a new model for language in the brain. We have two interconnected language centers, one for speech perception and one for speech production. Damage to either of these areas or the connecting pathway would result in different patterns of language impairment. This would come to be known as the wernicke geschwind model. We sometimes refer to it as the classical model in neurolinguistics. It's a famous example of a double dissociation. There are two completely separable functions, speech production and language comprehension, and each function relies on a distinct, separable brain structure. If this area is damaged, you'll have a very hard time speaking, but no problem understanding what's being said to you. And if you damage this area back here, you get the reverse pattern. You'll be able to speak, but you won't understand anything, and your speech will be jumbled and incoherent. According to this classical model, when we hear speech, the sound travels first from our ears to our auditory cortex. Here, sounds are decoded, and that information is sent to Wernicke's area, where meaning is assigned. Once we understand what was said, we can send that information along the arcuate fasciculus to Broca's area, where we can plan our response. 
That utterance is then sent to the primary motor cortex, which will tell the muscles how to make the sounds. But there's a problem. This model is a very oversimplified model for language. Turns out that the double dissociation may not be as clean and perfect as we used to think. For one, it's not exactly true that comprehension is unaffected by Broca's aphasia. People with Broca's aphasia do have very good comprehension for simple kinds of syntactic constructions, but their comprehension is not nearly as good for more complex sentences like passives and relative clauses. On top of that, lesions in Broca's area don't seem to be necessary or sufficient to induce grammatical deficits. This might be because Broca's and Wernicke's areas are also involved in other kinds of cognition besides language. And other parts of the brain not in this model are actually very important for language processing too. But there's an even bigger issue with this model. No one seems to agree exactly where Broca's and Wernicke's areas are. A 2015 survey asked 159 linguists, neuroscientists, and medical professionals to locate Broca's and Wernicke's areas on a diagram of a brain. Only 9% of scientists agreed with Wernicke's original definition. The most popular response, 26%, was for a region that the survey authors defined themselves. There was a little more consistency for Broca's area. 50% of scientists agreed that it should contain pars opocularis and pars triangularis. Another 23% expanded the region to include all of the inferior frontal gyrus. But this still leaves us without a clear majority consensus. The authors of this survey think we should abandon this terminology altogether. In their words, there is no consistent definition of Broca's and Wernicke's areas, and the terms should no longer be used. So where do we go from here? The classical model is based on aphasia studies going back to the 1800s. But we've learned a lot since then. Science has changed. Technology has changed. The introduction of neuroimaging technologies like PET, MEG, MRI, and ECOG gives us a new way to look inside the brain and see what's happening in real time. So what's the modern picture? First of all, there's a lot more action than just in Broca's and Wernicke's areas. There's a much larger extended language network. And within this network, there are two areas in particular that show up again and again and again in study after study after study. That's these two. They're not exactly the same as the old Broca and Wernicke areas, but they're in the neighborhood. Left inferior frontal gyrus and middle temporal gyrus. What do these two areas actually do? Middle temporal gyrus seems to have a lot to do with words. It was thought until very recently that word meanings were stored here in the temporal lobe. But some recent studies have shown that this isn't exactly true. We don't store word meanings here. This area is more of a switching station. It's the place words are routed through before they're sent to other brain regions. But the middle temporal gyrus doesn't just handle words. It might also be where we build sentence structure. All languages have an underlying tree-like structure. When we think of what to say, this is what our brain generates, a hierarchically organized tree of words. The process of assembling this tree most likely happens here in MTG, the same place words and word meanings are being pulled together. Convenient! What about left inferior frontal gyrus? This brain region seems to map pretty well to Broca's area, even if neuroscientists can't agree on its exact boundaries. We know that it's involved in production, but that's so vague. What does it do really? It seems to be heavily involved with syntactic structure. The more complex a sentence is, the more active Broca's area will be. And this is just as true when we're reading or listening as it is when we're speaking. In study after study, we see Broca's area hard at work, not just during production, but comprehension too. In 2008, a man named MJE suddenly lost his ability to speak. This turned out to be a case of Broca's aphasia caused by a lack of blood flow to LIFG. When doctors resupplied that brain region with blood, something kind of incredible happened. The patient showed a full recovery. He was tested on sentence comprehension before and after the reperfusion treatment, and his performance improved from as low as 20% all the way to 100% comprehension for the most complex kinds of sentences. And there's more! If we look closely, we'll see that there are regions within Broca's area that are involved with language, but there are other regions that do lots of other tasks. Things like recognizing musical sequences, doing arithmetic, perception of rhythmic motion, and spatial reasoning. Something all these tasks, including language, have in common is that they involve sequences. When we build a sentence, we create a tree-like structure. But if we want to actually say a sentence out loud, we have to convert that tree into a sequence, one word after another after another in a particular order. And this may be the secret function of Broca's area. It's not just involved in speech production, it's involved in virtually any task that involves processing sequences of any kind. Want more evidence? Neuroscientists have actually used electrodes to interfere with neurons inside Broca's area and found out that this interference can cause syntactic errors during speech production. Zapping neurons in the pars triangularis in particular can cause patients to mix up subjects and objects, saying things like, the boy is kicking the girl, when they really mean, the girl is kicking the boy. 
But what's going on here? They know what they want to say, but they can't get the words in the right order. There's something wrong with the sequencing. So here's our new model, the result of decades of work pulling together evidence from the study of aphasia, clinical science, and advanced neuroimaging technology. Temporal lobe regions on either side of MTG are involved in accessing word meanings and knowledge about concepts and events. This information is fed to middle temporal gyrus, which pulls together words and assembles them into hierarchical tree-like structures. These hierarchical structures aren't something we can pronounce. They have to be converted into sequences of pronounceable words. So we send the assembled structures to specialized regions within Broca's area where they can be sequenced before the sequence is sent to our motor system. Where does this leave our classical model where Broca's is for production and Wernicke's is for comprehension? Wernicke's area is not very well defined, but some areas in the general neighborhood do seem to be involved in accessing information about events and assembling structures, which are necessary steps during comprehension. And Broca's area seems to be all about sequencing, which is necessary for production. This explains why Broca's aphasia causes so much difficulty with speech. And Broca's is almost definitely involved in comprehension too, running the sequence process in reverse to create tree structures. But it may turn out that the reverse sequencing process is not strictly required for comprehension to take place, at least not all the time. And this might explain that original double dissociation. People with Broca's aphasia struggle with speaking but have pretty good comprehension. Maybe that's because there's only one way to get from structure to sequence, but we have many other options when we go from sequence to structure. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you like what you see here, please like and subscribe. We're gonna have a lot more content on topics related to language, the brain, and human cognition, so stick around. If you have a question about how language is processed in the brain, post a comment. I tried to condense decades worth of conflicting research into this video, but there are so many unanswered questions and debates that have not been resolved, and new research is dropping every day. We're really at the edge of human knowledge here. Thanks for coming along with me. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I hope the world lasts for you.